Welcome in to Two Four One Drafts. Austin Gale here with Mike Renner, PFF's Rookies and Draft Prospects podcast. A huge week ahead, a huge podcast mm-hmm. ahead. We're only doing one this week. This one a yes. little bit longer though, and it's going to be a good one. Right now, we have Raise the Glass segment talking about some of the top rookie performances. We also have the Pour One Out segment talking about some of those bad rookie performances. And in between that. We're going to bring on our guy, LaVisca Chenault, Colorado mm-hmm. wide receiver, projected first-round pick. He's high on your board. He's high on PFF's board. 13th Very, on yep, PFF's board. 13 on PFF's big board. He's going to be a fun interview. We're definitely looking forward to that. Then we'll dive into our Rolling Rook segment, talking about some of the highest, you know, top rookie performances from the past week. And then our Blackout segment, talking about some of those bad rookie performances. And let's go ahead and move forward here. Let's start with that raise a glass. Nico Collins, Michigan receiver, going against Indiana. One of the bigger games of the week. Yeah, had himself a monster of a game. Six of seven targets for 165 yards three touchdowns a broken tackle and actually the one target that he didn't haul in not his fault Shea Patterson overthrows him on a double move is actually a really nice double move against cover two really usually you don't see a lot of double moves against cover two a stop and go he got the safety to bite in the hole on the stop and go was wide open not his fault that he missed it real nice game from Nico Collins a lot of people like this Michigan wide receiver core Truthfully, I don't. New Collins is the only one I think of there that I think is legit. Over NFL. DPJ. Yes. Uh, Don Fields Jones, I am not a fan of. I, am, mm-hmm. I just don't think he has the juice down the field. Nico Collins, though, does, and it's 6'4, 218, has some intriguing size. To me, he's my favorite of that group. So you're telling me Shea Patterson missed the turkey hole? On Thanksgiving week. Oh no! He, so the safety bit on the turkey hole, oh, and okay. that was uh, I don't know. But if you're going to bite on a turkey be. hole at any point in yeah. the season, it's got to be the week of Thanksgiving, week, yeah. which I think is very fair. Um, for with Eagle Collins, you know, very similar receiver to some. They're kind of popping up on the timeline right now that people are kind of falling in love with Brandon Ayuk and Denzel M- Denzel Mims mm-hmm. of Baylor, both invited to the Senior Bowl. Brandon Ayuk of Arizona State. Talk to me about these two receivers, where they are currently for you in this 2020 NFL draft. Both have opportunities to improve their stock down there in Mobile, Alabama for the Senior Bowl. But both of these guys are intriguing. They're big dudes, which you always kind of have to hold a reservation. You're not sure if these guys can move at the next level, but they're big with some suddenness to their game. Yeah, all guys pretty explosive. I would compare uh, AU to someone like Cordero Patterson, though, and that I'm not sure he's great in terms of his ball skills, uh, route running ability. With that ball in his hands, he is cr- he is a threat to take it to the house every time. I think his, as a kick returner, he's averaged something like 34 yards a return, and that's not without even having a a return touchdown, which is a very high number, uh, has a punt return touchdown array this year. He is dynamic playmaker. I, I'm just not sure he's a wide receiver just yet, even though, yes, he does have a lot, you know, 1,125 yards outproducing someone like Nikhil Harry last year, but he's getting a lot of screens in that offense. They're pumping him. The target's similar to what Nikhil Harry did last year, so I'm, I'm not as high on him as others. Like I said, I just don't think he is a, a complete receiver just yet, and for him to be that as a senior, that's worrisome to me. Only 420, 74 yards in his career prior to this year Mims Baylor guy uh, I'd probably like a little bit more pretty sudden but he's kind of upright as a route runner and they another guy who they just pump targets and he's running this limited route tree at Baylor with a lot of go balls so he has something like the fourth most contested targets in the country this year mm-hmm. just because they're just giving him a ton of chances and I don't think he's been good or something like 14 of 34 in contested situations this year that's just that's not a great rate uh, for a college wide receiver so he's big explosive but I, I still have reservations about uh, again, that route tree and his ability to actually in contest situations. So of those three, I'd probably say Collins, my favorite uh, of that bunch. Uh, but still, I think they're, they're, they're all down the board for us comparatively. None of them made our latest top 100. Yeah, of those three, I haven't had, I've watched Nico Collins a ton, but I, I dove into um, Mims, Denzel Mims, the yep. Baylor wide receiver, a lot last night looking at his targets. I was really impressed with that. I feel like it's the first thing you look for in a bigger receiver prospect is, is he sudden? Does he, can, yes. he, can he create separation he on, on breaking routes? I would say ha- absolutely, but I do have some of the reservations you do have. I mean, the contested catch numbers aren't great, though he does have a couple highlight reel mm-hmm. ones. I think he attacks the ball well in the air, but he's getting, you know, the volume of contested catches he has at this point, I think is a product of that limited route tree like you said a lot of go routes does you know there's some slants mixed in there a nice hitch or two but again he's not running a very diverse route tree um, like some other receivers some smaller receivers yeah and then mims has drop issues as well uh 17 drops on uh 129 catchable over the last two years that's a that's run you know 13 14 percent drop rate that's, mm-hmm. that's not good yeah. for uh, uh that's not what you want to see going to go into the nfl 
Okay. Let's move forward here. Xavier McKinney, he came away with two interceptions against Western Kentucky. Carolina. Western Carolina. <laughs> Western Carolina. That was a rough game to watch. Say, Western Carolina was not playing well. Not great in terms of competition, but you can still evaluate in terms of, uh, you know, he was had to split uh, one of his picks. He had to split two vertical routes and then react to one. Like, it's still something that uh, will tra- is a translatable skill just because it's not like a one-on-one sort of play. It's still a football play and at safety. Uh, it's a play you have to make, and he did. Goes over his shoulder, picks the ball off, and another forced fumble uh, in that game. So a big game from him. Uh, I, I'm not. We haven't been super high on him. Uh, he's outside our top five safeties at the moment, but he is versatile. Uh, he is moving up the board. I, I've uh, liked what I've seen from him more this year than I did heading into this season. Uh, I, I thought he was more product of the guys around him there in that Alabama offense the year before this. Uh, I think he's more making more plays this season, though. Definitely have to covet that versatility. 246 defensive snaps at box safety, 200 at slot corner, and then you have another 200 at free safety, playing all three of those levels. And I think that has a ton of value in the NFL. You see that with the Derwin James, Jamal Adams of the world, and I think uh, Xavier McKinney, Mm -hmm. maybe not as good as those two, but definitely in that mold of I can play everything, I can do it all. So that's um, interesting. You know, Right now he's got an 85.4 coverage grade so far this year. He had an 80.4 coverage grade the year prior. Good production from him, good coverage coverage grades. I think it'll be interesting to see how he moves forward forward and how people value and if he declares and whatnot. Yeah, if he declares, true. Absolutely. All right, moving forward here. Logan Wilson versus Colorado State. Got got, got to give some love for this guy. Logan Wilson, Wyoming linebacker. Not really on our radar. I hadn't... I hadn't actually watched him in depth before he got the Senior Bowl invite, and then I go back and watch him, and I was pretty impressed uh, with his athleticism. And the dude is six two two fifty. You know, you see all these That's linebackers. I know you see all these linebackers in college, and you're like, that guy, that guy taps out at two fifteen max. Like this, these are safeties. You got a long way to go before you're ever going to play in the NFL, or if you do, you better be, you know. You, you better be freakishly athletic to play at that size, and so few are. So you see a guy who actually has that size and then movement skills, and all of a sudden, you know, kind of opens your eyes a little bit, and he's playing over at Wyoming. So lots to like about this guy. Colorado State this past week had a career-high 91.6 grade, so got a little pumped up after that Senior Bowl invite. Got five stops, had a pick. Real nice pick from cover two because he's he back backs out one way. Uh, you know, over his right shoulder, has to turn back left for a post route coming in behind him on the other side, makes the pick a uh, game winner, actually, in that game, or game ender, basically, towards the end of that one. So, real nice play from him. He's got some coverage skills. Excited to see what he does at the Senior Bowl. I-, I think he could have his draft stock shoot through the roof with a big week there in Mobile. Guy looks like a beef house in these images here. Where's number 30 for Wyoming? And you're looking back at his high school career, played wide receiver and defensive back. So, he must have added yeah. some LBs <laughs> to start playing linebacker. And I think that's where you probably see some of that athleticism in that He's not this six foot two, two hundred fifty linebacker that you know is just stuffing the run and playing I mean, two downs. What else are you going to do in Wyoming? You're going to go out party on Friday night. You're going to go. True. No, you're going to go to the weight room. I'm sure uh, the parties in Wyoming are stellar. I mean, there's not a lot of people there, but of, they're stellar. It's probably okay. a lot of meth. Going you know, all the, your family somehow shows up. You're like, yeah, we were coming <laughs> to this one too. But um, I'm sure it's interesting. Um, let's go to Harrison Bryant. Yeah, I, I think I saw Lane Kiffin tweet out um, give some high praise for him. Uh, Harrison Bryant, the tight end for FAU. Mm-hmm. Uh, he caught 10 of 11 targets for 182 yards and a touchdown, five broken tackles. I think a couple of them came on one play. It's the play that Lane, yeah. Lane Kiffin tweeted out, kind of praising Harrison Bryant for the potential to be the Mackey Award winner. He's a guy that we haven't talked about a lot, but I think he is a good tight end in this class. Yeah, I, I think he's gained a lot of muscle over the course of the offseason because my biggest gripe on him coming into this year was he just looked so slight at the tight end position. I was just like, you, you're, he's not going to fool anybody. You, you know, you bring a guy out there, you call him a tight end, but if he's 6'5", 235, that's a wide receiver mm-hmm. in the NFL. You're not gonna, no one's gonna, you know, match your two tight end set there with heavy personnel because he's just not going to be a threat as a run blocker. Uh, but I think he is bigger this year. He looks so stronger, uh, definitely at the catch point and after the catch. Just from my, you know, limited viewing of him, or just from my, you know, purely uh, opinion, I don't have any inside info on if he is much stronger or not. But he, I mean, production wise, is producing better than he ever has at any point in his career. 890 yards, 58 catches, leads tight ends uh, in both of those figures there this season. So uh, he's been good. 11 broken tackles on those 58 catches. So uh, we'll see what he ends up. I I think the weigh-in for him uh, at Senior Bowl, at Combine, will be big just to see, you know, is he playing at an NFL weight or is he really just uh, this sort of tweener that's not going to be right now? Because I don't think he's four being undersized. He's not like Hunter Bryant, the Washington tight end, where he's like, oh, damn, he moves like a wide receiver. Dude still moves like a tight end like he's still gonna run something like four seven so at that point i don't know it's kind of 
kind of what are you going to be at the next level if you're undersized and not that athletic? He's also have 90.0 plus PFF receiving grades in each of the last three years, including this year with a 92.6. Uh, he has five drops on the year on 81 targets. He only has six drops over the last two years, however. Uh, definitely an interesting prospect, a mm -hmm. small school guy, one to dive into for sure. Um, let's go ahead and move forward here to the poor one out segment, talking about some of these prospect performances that weren't so great. And I think mm -hmm. the easiest one to bring up, Justin Herbert, an opportunity to really elevate his draft stock, to really push himself back into the conversation be one of the you know I think the, the, maybe beat out Burrow for top yeah. quarterback drafted this was a dud from him against Arizona State a, a, a very poor uh, performance for him six turnover worthy plays on the big stage all of the concerns kind of came out in this one dude it's just uh so 19 to 35 290 yards two touchdowns two picks but like I said six turnover worthy plays of those 19 completions only 10 were past the line of scrimmage so nine behind the line of scrimmage uh it just it wasn't good, um, and this is what you worried about. Well, that's what we said coming into the year. He has these inexplainable, inexplicable dud of a game where no, he just looks like he's not processing anything quickly. And it's, the biggest thing for me is, and it's kind of a theme even when he does play well, is he doesn't know when to take the chances down the football field. Cannon for an arm. Best arm talent in the class. Like, and his accuracy, we don't have – like his accuracy is good, too. Like He is accurate with the football. He has NFL-level accuracy, has elite arm strength but doesn't know when to take that chance down the football field. And you saw it again in this one. You get a go route versus off coverage, and he heaves it up. Like you, you, That's not the time to take the chance on the mm -hmm. go route. It, the time to take a chance to go route is against press when a guy might, you know, shoulder to shoulder with a DB, put it on his leverage. It's not when the DB's already bailing off. Like There are times to take those chances, and he just doesn't seem to have that feel for when to do so. Uh, showed up again in this one, 40.3 passing grade on the day. Uh, if it's ugly against Arizona State, like I said, we said circle the Utah game. I'm not even sure you need to at this point. I don't think if this is, if these games, the way these games keep popping up, I'm a little worried about. Uh, I'm just, I don't think I'm going to be. I don't think he's going to an have answered my concerns about his projection to the next level, even if he balls out against Utah. And it's not something that we have only seen this year. I mean, if you look at back last year, a 90.7 PFF passing grade in Week One against Bowling Green, 90.0 against Portland, and then a 59.8 against San Jose State, 90 in Stanford, 90 at Cal. They drops to 62.2 against Washington. I think on these bigger stages, there's just these games, like you said, where he doesn't know, you know, doesn't know when to take the shots, and despite having all the talent the arm talent and actually he does have lays an egg on the biggest stages and I think that's just a huge concern it's a big part of why you know he's not super high you know on your list right now on PFS list at all I think with that being said obviously stock down after this game where are you seeing Justin Herbert you know landing when it's all said and done not in the draft not actually in the draft but on your board on the board I still think he's just going to be in the teens like, mm -hmm. I still think he'll be a guy who I'd take a chance on in the middle of the first round but if I have a top five pick and you're talking between a stud at a cornerback position you know of another valuable position or a guy like Justin Herbert who just I think is fatally flawed in some ways uh I'll, let me take that other position you know I don't have to pigeonhole myself into this guy who uh just has too many question marks so uh, I do think that but you, you get more in the middle of the first round where you're debating between him and maybe a defensive tackle who's only gonna play 600 snaps a game for you yeah maybe yeah then mm -hmm. go take a chance on a quarterback like that but yeah I just think at the top of the draft the value uh, I'd question it too much to go and get someone like Herbert but I do think yeah so actually where he goes in the draft I still think he goes top five like someone's gonna fall in love when a guy has a can like that mm -hmm. someone's gonna fall in love especially because so much of the pre-draft process is against yeah. error I mean yeah. it's it's the combine it's the interviews it's the arm talent the pro uh -huh. day it's the exactly. practices at, in, at senior bowl I mean he's not gonna be there but I think it's 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 interesting because a lot of the pre-draft process is this this opportunity to build hype for a guy like Justin Herbert who isn't going to be playing against Arizona State after this you and know it, and then that thing and I like him more than someone like Josh Allen coming out mm -hmm. I think he has a better chance of you know, succeeding in the NFL level than someone like Josh Allen did. And so if Josh Allen goes, would he go seventh or mm -hmm. still top 10? Yeah. Herbert's going to go top 10. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're going to have a team like the Denver Broncos, John Elway, just like going goo goo over him, and I think you're going to see I mean, we've said high. it a thousand times, but yeah, he's going to go to the Denver Broncos. Yep. <laughs> All right. Trey Smith, he's another guy that we're going to pour one out for. The only two pour one outs, which is kind of nice. A little bit yeah, of we a didn't want to week. Yeah. pile on. Trey holidays. Smith, three pressures allowed, penalty, 36.1 pass blocking grade for the guy. That yeah. is a not, not a good week for him. Ran against Jordan Elliott, you know, in, the, mm -hmm. in Missouri this past week. Tough, tough matchup for him. I just. Man, I don't think he comes out this year. Everyone loves him as pro I, I like him as a prospect. He made our top hundred um, on the interior, which is you know tough. We don't think the value of an interior offensive lineman isn't that high. But honestly, I think he should have 
stuck at left tackle. I get why they moved him inside. It was just, you know, it's easier to uh, – because he didn't have an offseason to practice. You don't want to throw a guy to the Wolves on the edge without it. But I think he has the traits to play left tackle. Should stick there, but I also think he should come back for another year because – like I said, hasn't had two two straight off seasons now with his lung issues to you know refine his craft, and it's such a position. It's a position that takes so much refinement that I would I think he could push his draft stock up way higher with a full off season and kicking out at left tackle for Tennessee if he does that. I'm not sure what what their plans on doing if he would come back, but it's just uh, I think he's more of, he's going to be a mid rounder at this point. Could work himself into the first round conversation if he did you know had a big year next year. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, you know, with Trey Smith, too, I think you have to come back to gather those snaps. You have to c- come back to get more experience. And like you said, it's a position that it's not one that you, you want to be like a running back where you don't have a ton of time. You need a ton of, you know, ton yes, of opportunities exactly. to get better, to show off that you actually have that ability. I think Trey Smith is a candidate to move back. All right, we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to dive into this LaVisca interview. Definitely looking forward to this one. I think the listeners should definitely dive into this. Probably a first-round pick when it's all said and done. A very talented yeah. wide receiver with a great story coming out of Colorado. Let's go ahead and dive in. All right, well, let's go ahead and get right to it. You know, here at PFF, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with us, but we do a ton of, you know, great. we grade every player on every play at the collegiate level. We look at where players line up, how they do as pass rushers, how they do catching the football, passers, all of those things. And with you specifically, uh, LaVisco, we, we look at you in 2018. You know, Colorado used you a lot in the slot. You, you were a prim- you know, not primarily a slot receiver, but you played some in the slot and some outside. And now this year, you're playing mostly at slot receiver. I want to talk about that transition or not slot receiver, outside receiver. Talk to me about yeah, that, outside, yeah. talk to me about that transition of you playing a ton of outside receiver this year. Um, it was only reason I'm mostly outside now is because of the injuries I've been dealing with this whole year. Um, that's really the only thing. <laughs> oh, right. Uh, or if it, if it wasn't for that, we would, I would see me everywhere, just like last year. Oh. But well, not really because we got different. We got different offensive coordinators. So, but. If I was more healthy, I'd be moving around more. Oh, okay, I, I didn't. I didn't know that. Do, do you see yourself kind of wanting to play outside receiver more in the NFL, or do you want to? You kind of see yourself as this do it all type, this gadget player, backfield slot. Do it all. Gotcha. I want to be able. I want to be able to. I want to be able for my coach to trust me and put me anywhere on the set. Um, and just to dive into some more specifics, what, what what injuries have you kind of been battling this year? Are there multiple, and, and how, what are the extent of those? Well, so from the beginning of the season, um, I was just coming back out those surgeries, and I, I just wasn't myself. Mm-hmm. And about fourth, fifth game, when I was like getting myself, getting to myself, I got hurt in the Arizona State game, and I, I messed up my abdominal. Mm-hmm. And I've been battling that the whole year. It's still, it's still here. Um, and then, I, um, Stanford game, I have to extend my knee, gotcha. so I've been bothering. It, that's been bothering me for the rest of. The, years also very interesting well yeah uh, that's 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 that must suck man how's that been battling through this injury i'm sure it's got to be a ton of rehab oh yeah ton of rehab ton of rehab early in the mornings late late afternoon um but it's part, it's part of the process and i'm just gonna keep doing me and just keep doing whatever i can do mm-hmm. so uh, i you know you know you said you want to be this do-it-all receiver in the nfl backfield slot all that stuff um you know, why is that why do you want to be this guy that can kind of you know you you get the ball in your hands so much doing all these different things um because um, i think just with my ability my my height my size and my still being able to move as quick and fast as i do exercise it's just harder for you know defenses to see from me Mm-hmm. And I just, I think, I think I, I can, I can put it on my back. I can put the thing on my back. I feel I can do anything. That's, I feel I can do anything. I just have the mindset that I have. I want to stay on that that athletic ability and size. Everywhere I read, I'm I'm reading into you before we do this interview, and it's you're a freak in the weight room, a freak athletically. I, I read somewhere it's Julio Jones, but bigger. Like they, they, people have really high praise for you as an athlete. I need to know what kind of numbers are you putting up in the weight room? What kind of speed are we, are we going to see in the forty come combine? See now that's, that's when those surgeries from last year come in. Um, if if I didn't get hurt. I would, my numbers would be even more crazy, and I would have been able to focus on my body more. But since I had to rehab and go to those surgeries, I wasn't able to do what I wanted. But my squat is like a, maybe like 525. My bench was 315, but, you know, I had to labor them, so I couldn't, I couldn't do any extra. Um, 
Pound clean, I could have did way more than what I did. I think I did 315. Uh, yeah, I mean, all, all those numbers I got right now, I could, I would kill that. <laughs> <laughs> That's good yeah. to hear. What, what about um, what do you what do you were you setting any goals for the forty yard dash? I'm sure you got some you got some good numbers there. You know. Um, just from when people talk to me, they they think that's a, a area where I'm not strong yet, and uh, that's that's where I'm gonna come in and just have to do me and prove a lot of people wrong. Absolutely, and I think you do have some 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 people you need to prove wrong. I think looking you know, you're looking at some draft reports early on. You look at Tom McShay of ESPN saying you know he doesn't see you running a normal route tree. You know you're going to be an underneath guy at the next level, not necessarily a guy that stretches the field on vertical routes. What do you say to that? Do you see yourself as this guy that can stretch the field, be a deep route vertical receiver? I feel like I can do anything, and. Yeah, that's, like I said, that's just my mindset. And if you first tell me to go do something, I'm going to do it. And I also think just with my abilities and what I was blessed with, I think I'll be able to do anything. I can I can run a deep route. I can do a short route. I can do a double move. I can do anything. And I, I, like I said, I think people like don't really see that. And that's kind of crazy to me, <laughs> honestly, because I, I feel like I can do a little bit of everything. So there's no – perfect prospect going into the NFL. Everyone has something that they have to work on. What do you think is for you oh, yeah. right now is the biggest thing that you're trying to work on uh, to, you know, to improve? And, you know, and no one's a perfect wide receiver. What part of your game are you focusing on the most and saying, I need to improve this. This is what people need to see from me, uh, see more of from me? Um, I mean, I think I have great hands, but I want to uh, get better at attacking the ball. And I um, also want to like just route running. Really, everything. that's what I'm saying, like, I think I can do everything, and like I see myself with everything, but I also think I can get better at everything. Do you have an NFL comp for yourself, or someone that you look to in the NFL and say, "I can do what he is doing"? I think I, you know, my game compares well to him because we, as NFL, you know, draft analysts, everyone loves to see, "Oh, this guy compares to this guy." Uh, do you have someone that you look up to in that sort of regard? I'm um, of course um, Julio Jones. Um, I think I have his ability to like run out the check. Um, I can name I can name a lot of receivers. Uh, Jarvis Landry, his run out the catch, his catching ability, um, his just the way he carries it, the way he plays. I feel like I do the same. Um, Devontae Adams, D Hop, like I, I can name I can name all night. Just a version of all the best receivers in the NFL, I guess. That sounds pretty sweet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know. I, I question you. I'm not saying I do everything they do, but I'm saying it's one part of their game that I have. Mm-hmm. Might as well throw Calvin Johnson in the mix. I don't know. I'm, I'm willing to get excited there. Um, but I, wanna, I, I know you said you can do everything. You can do it all. I want to get a little specific with you. Do you have like a favorite route or a favorite play that you run at Colorado that you know that's where you're your best at? I'm getting the ball on this play. I'm gonna make. I'm gonna make a huge gain or whatever it may be. Wow, okay. I wow. the ball right in my head. <laughs> Definitely great. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, and here's another question, too. We talk a ton about you know, your positional versatility. You can play in the slot, wildcat, outside receiver, you know, great after the catch. But at the receiver position, a lot of, it's a lot of mind games, too. You'll run into cornerbacks that want to chat like Marcus Peters and, and get in your ear a little bit. You know, what's your take on – talking you know talking to cornerbacks on the field do you like to trash talk at all or do you do you play that at all i love trash talking honestly i'm not a, i'm not a trash talker. i'm gonna listen to what you gotta say and i'm just gonna um reply back with my action on the field mm-hmm. that's probably yeah. the best way to do it i mean that's probably the best way to do it um yeah i feel like when you get to talking trash and things go a different way I think last thing here, I know Renner, uh, my, Renner mentioned that, you know, what what do you want to work on? You said everything, which I think is a great answer. What do you think specifically you're best at? Is it your yards after the catch ability? Is it your play in contested catch situations? I would love to know what you think you're the best at. I think I'm the best at, um, let's see. <laughs> uh, Hard to pick. I, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's just, Catching the ball in, in, in the yak, I think that's just what I'm good at. And my just my lateral quickness and just to make make people miss. Yeah, I think a lot of people would agree. You're great after the catch and, and definitely a very fun player to watch. We really appreciate you taking the time to jump on uh, jump on an interview with us, and we definitely look forward to seeing you finish out your career at Colorado and then also this pre-draft process. Thank you. Awesome. Have a good one, man. 
All right, let's dive into Rolling Rooks, where we talk about some of the top rookie performances from the past weekend. And there's no better name to start with than A.J. Brown, the Ole Miss product, now playing for the Tennessee Titans, and Ryan Tannehill, who's you know surging of late. He made PFF's Team of the Week this yeah. past week. A.J. Brown caught four or five targets, 135 yards, and touchdown. Also broke two tackles after the catch. This guy's looking very, very good out of the gate. I would say one of the better rookie receivers in the NFL right now. Yeah, I mean, he is eighth in the NFL in yards per route run eighth like he is top 10 when he's on the football field he wasn't on the football field much early in the season mm-hmm. we obviously we complained about that and you know Tajay Sharp out snapping out him snapping. out of the game we were just like what the hell is going on starting to get more playing time 135 yards this week four or five targets touchdown a couple of broken tackles it's after 81 yards a couple of weeks back against Carolina a few weeks back against Carolina I mean he looks legit like he just mm-hmm. like looks like with the guy we saw at you know Ole Miss that like he is a very complete wide receiver. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how he lasted fifty one. Like this wide receiver class made no sense to me that it got pushed down when uh, I thought just so many teams could use help. At, like it's a yeah. passing league. What are you doing? Passing on a lot of these talented wide receivers. But I think we're seeing it now how many you know second and third rounders are still producing. Yeah, with AJ Brown too. I think what what came away for me is that you know he got overshadowed a bit by DK Metcalf. I think DK Metcalf kind of took the league by storm at the combine and with yeah. that picture next to him, all that stuff. But AJ Brown, when he turned on the film, was a very dominant wide receiver. He played well, and some people I think uh, isolate him as just a slot guy. I mean, he mm-hmm. played a ton of slot at Ole Miss, but he had a ton of success at outside receiver as well. I mean, he he played really well at outside receiver when DK Metcalf went down with injury. I think, like you said, a complete complete receiver and we're seeing that very early there's one route that really stuck out to me this past week where he just barrels out of the gate off the line he has a free release mm-hmm. he's a threat to people threat deep and then he does a great in cutting route and takes that pass I, I think AJ Brown really impressive out of the gate and I think he is what they wanted Corey Davis to be in terms yeah, of having that impact honestly, early yeah. on but I think so a lot of the eight a lot of people age scouting is like a big thing in the uh, sort of like the fancy biz. community, <laughs> fancy community for wide receivers in college, and sometimes I think it's overblown. But when you are 19 years old and mm-hmm. you go for 1,252 yards in the SEC, chances are you're going to be a pretty damn, you're a pretty damn good wide receiver. Mm-hmm. You know, chances are you're doing something right there uh, in an Ole Miss receiving core that had a lot of talent. It's not like it was just him and they pumped him targets and they had no one else to go mm-hmm. to. No, they had a lot of other people to go to, but AJ Brown still stood above them. So I do think that to me, then you know, that holds some value when you have this talented receiving core and they keep going back to this one guy I think there's a reason for it and you just don't see a lot of like I said a lot of 19 year olds putting up 1,252 yards Dude, you don't SEC. get over 200 yards in the SEC at 19 years old yeah. you barely hold your weight in there I, that's very impressive though I think they have what's that metric I think I see it in the fantasy community it's like dominant age breakout oh, rating or something like those? that I don't want to get into that um, level but I do agree with phenom. you phenom phenom rating but then you also have you know with sim- similarly like younger like Marvin Wilson where you're dominating yeah. like 19 20 years exactly. old and Dexter be, Lawrence also yeah. like freshman like mm-hmm. that's that doesn't happen unless there's something special. You're not supposed to be that yeah. strong, that yeah. athletic, that developed at yeah. that age to a point where you're having that level of success so young. I think there is some weight to it. There's definitely some weight mm-hmm. to it. Um, let's move forward here. Michael Dieter of the Miami Dolphins. Actually t- coming. Playing. Actually playing well. He's not graded well so far this year. <laughs> I think he ranks inside the bottom 10 in overall grade on the year. Yeah. But he's coming off a good game this past week. Yeah. Well, only allowed one pressure on 50 pass blocking snaps against the Cleveland Browns. Uh, did so well that they cut one of the guys on the Cleveland Browns uh, interior. Who's, in, who's his name? Slipping. Something Lawrence. Yeah. They cut him afterwards because if you can't beat Michael Dieter, mm-hmm. uh, obviously it's probably light switch probably isn't going to flip on for you. But no, good game for Dieter. Like I said, 88.6 pass blocking grade on the day for him. So over the past two weeks, 75.0 against Buffalo, 88.6. Might see a little bit of a turnaround from that's good to see though mm-hmm. when you, because the Dolphins like, they need all the help they can get along that. Yeah. Well, what was your opinion of Dieter coming out? We had him around third round. Uh, mm-hmm. I thought it was Dieter was clearly the better of between him and Ben Shaw. Uh, did we did not care for Ben Shaw coming out? He went, ended up being UDFA. We had him uh, in like a sixth, seventh roundish grade for him. Uh, Dieter though, we were in the third, fourth range for him. Thought where the draft him was right. Uh, loved his versatility, um, but I did think guard was probably his best position, and so. Yes, it's been a rough go out the gate, but I still, you know, rookie offensive lineman, not to say you can throw the rookie season out the window, but it's just going to be tough no matter who you are. Mm-hmm. 
All right, let's go ahead and move forward here. Nice little praise for Teeter after what has been usually a, a very mm-hmm. tough season for him. Go to a guy that slipped too far in the draft. Way this too one it was far. crazy to me how yeah. far he slipped. Uh, Amani Oruwarie, a you know, former Penn State product, now playing for the Detroit Lions, played 44 snaps this past week, had a very, very nice interception in this game, and also played well on the, on the other targets, only allowed three receptions for 21 yards from five targets. This was a huge game for Amani, a guy that you really liked coming out. Yeah, Amani has only seen uh, only seen nine snaps uh, before this this <laughs> week. Uh, that was against Dallas back in week eleven. So last week, prior week prior, forty four in this one has a monster game. Looked fantastic. I mean, the pick he had on the outbreaking route from the slot was uh, beautiful. Uh, not a lot of guys make that play. I don't care who, if you're a rookie or a veteran, very headsy play. And then had a, had a nice little uh, go route where he just ran the route for the receiver, bided him off the ball. Like, he was all over. So three of five targets, only 21 yards. Uh, and the one first down he did give up was a drag route against off in man coverage. Like, he, he had no chance. No one's making that play. Uh, I don't care if you're Patrick Peterson, you're not making that play. So a really good day for Aruare, a 90.0 coverage grade. There you go. And a guy that is, you know, similar to Michael Dieter that has kind of been on the on the blackout segment probably too long. DeAndre there Baker finally Makes had it. a good game. Zero receptions allowed from two targets on 33 coverage snaps. And both of those targets, it was good good, good reps for DeAndre Baker. I was going to say, well, you do get the caveat of it was Mitchell Trubisky. So if the targets you get against Trubisky are kind of just like, he's not reading coverage really. Mm-hmm. We'll just say that. But he did, he jumps a slant route against Allen Robinson, and then a kind of an out route in the end zone, which is where we thought DeAndre Baker, that we shot, thought that should be his bread and butter around mm-hmm. the goal line. Physicality comes into play. Did it again. Got right into Allen Robinson's hip pocket and, you know, shut that route down as well. So 0 of 2, two targets of the day, not a single catch. That's DeAndre Baker. That's, mm-hmm. that's the guy we had hoped we had seen, uh, the guy who got torched deep for the first 10 weeks of the year. Um, was also the guy we feared we might see. But I, I do think this is kind of your uh, – if your upshot of him is a playmaker. He's Mm -hmm. not going to be a completely locked down one side of the field. He is going to be a, uh, you know, 15 pass breakup, but maybe also like 700 yards he gives up on yeah, you. Yeah. But you're going to live with that mm-hmm. because he makes plays on the football. Well, he plays he plays the ball in front of him very well. Yes. I mean, he plays like in breaking routes in front of him very well. The problem is that too often he's playing the you know routes way behind him. Yeah, those are the more high leverage deep. ones. Yeah, exactly. Because I mean, you can't afford to get beat deep at outside cornerback, especially when you're going against some of the receivers in the NFL. I think you're going to see that with DeAndre Baker, but he also has to be a monster against slants, a monster against these in cutting routes to where he can jump at the ball and go make a play of those pass breakups, like you said. Um, and speaking of pass breakups, Jamel Dean, Tampa Bay Buccaneers rookie. The Bucs got something. Tampa Bay Buccaneers uh, rookie cornerback. He had three pass breakups this past week. from um, Over the past four weeks, Jamel Dean leads all NFL cornerbacks in pass breakups with eight. Mm-hmm. He was benched for all of week 11 because we quote-unquote wanted to play more zone coverage. He, he comes back into this game um, um, for Tampa Bay and has another three pass breakups. This guy's wow. everywhere. I mean, Dude. to get your hands on the ball that many times as a rookie is insane. I mean, I, I, he's having a really good start. Even with that bad game against DK Metcalf mm-hmm. and the Seattle Seahawks, he had three pass breakups in that one. I, I, I'm really impressed with what Jamel Dean does. He looks very good on the football I would say, there's now. something here to this because you just don't get your hands on that many balls that mm-hmm. quickly unless you see in the game processing Or you're your mom. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, was just, I walked right into that one. Yeah. But three of nine targets on this one, 34 yards. Like you said, three pass breakups. He leads all rookies in pass breakups. He's only played three games. Mm-hmm. And he leads all rookies in pass breakups. There's uh, That's insane. This is a very encouraging start. The like Of all the cornerbacks the Bucks have right now, you know, after a thousand of them, you mm-hmm. know, in the past handful of years, I would pick him, you know, over, over all these guys, just yeah. based off these three game sample size, because mm-hmm. that's a crazy, that's just a rate of plays on the football that you don't see. Uh, that's too much to, you know, too much of an outlier to be phony else. To get your hand on eight balls in four weeks is just unheard of at this point. I really it's like have. a sorority girl. Exactly. It's just incredible. Well, Jamel, there's one play too. Deep down the field, I think he's defending Calvin Ridley. And he, I think he's a little behind, but he ends up getting up for it and gets a nice pass breakup to get that one. I think that one deep down the field was one of my favorites. He had a couple other ones kind of playing the ball in front of him. But Jamel Dean, impressive speed, impressive size, and now yeah. impressive, you know, impressive um, ball skills. I, I think he, you know, he's a playmaker for sure. I think I'm, Jamel Dean, I'm glad some, though that I'm not the only one who struggled to correctly put an evaluation on Dean Mm -hmm. like the NFL drops him to 94th overall like a lot of teams passed on him that needed cornerbacks uh, because he was just like like we mentioned before in the podcast, he looked like a linebacker yeah. out there, and all he did was sit. He still kind of looks weird. Yeah. I mean, the shoulder pad. I mean, it's a it's a very weird body type. Yeah, 
but he's balling. Yep, doesn't look the part, maybe. I guess it's, mm. you know, people are always looking for people to look the part. Exactly. Let's go to the next segment here, blackout segment. Let's talk about some of these bad rookie performances. Corey Ballantyne, not great. Yeah, I mean, throwing a sixth rounder out there into a starting role, which mm-hmm. is what they're doing for him, not going to work out well for you, but he now has a 29.3 coverage grade on the season with three starts now under his belt. Dude, he allowed 12 receptions from 14 targets for 188 yards and a touchdown yeah. for the Giants this past week. That is bad. And that's against the Bears. That's against Mitch Trubisky. Mitch Trubisky. <laughs> like, Mitch Trubisky doesn't complete 12 out of 14 targets against air. Mm-hmm. Like, that's, that's almost like a... Uh, that's a vast outlier. So not great from Corey Ballantyne. Basically, air. I mean, mm-hmm. his coverage was air. All right, let's go to the guy, Andrew Wingard. This is, I have a good story with Andrew Wingard. A- Andrew Wingard, well, former Wyoming safety, kind of built with the linebackers, got great hair, though. The mm-hmm. hair is fantastic. I think it's blonde, straight, it flows out of the helmet with, with great poise. Um, but this past week, a 30.0 overall grade against the Tennessee Titans, allows two receptions from two targets for 37 yards and a touchdown. Was also bad, very bad against the run. It, it was, it was his awful. Angles. His angles are terrible and his speed is terrible that you was take bad thing. angles and you're slow it's not gonna work i don't out. know what he ran but it looked like he was trying he looked like he ran like a four seven yeah <laughs> actually i'm looking right now he ran a four five six I, it did not look like that that no. did not show up no this past week i mean, mean derrick henry is looking derrick like, henry is fast yeah yeah when he gets in the open field he is fast mm-hmm. but wingard was like losing like four to five yards of ground on him quickly so yeah. it wasn't great at the combine andrew wingard was one of the guys that doesn't get a podium but gets a table mm-hmm. and i sat with him and talked about him because uh, mountain west guy san diego yeah. state alum go aztecs talking about him going against san, san diego state donnell pumphrey nick bodden you know the big the big san diego mm-hmm. state we really really bonded Connected, in that moment yeah. and I, I think you know him and i could be friends down the road honestly and uh if i did need well, another co-host it might be i was gonna say if, if you need a co-host it might be soon that yeah. is available. and if he does he's got good hair probably better hair than you where are we at with that I mean, I, I'm not like proud of my hair, so yeah, he probably does have. You're better not proud of your hair, but you wear it like that. I wear it up all the time because it's not; it doesn't look good down. It looks like ass when I put it down. You think it looks good up? I mean, it doesn't look. No, great I'm just, up I'm just kidding. I'm just messing. I mean, we can't really talk hair at PFF if we don't bring up Stevie P. Okay, mm-hmm. I mean, Stevie Stevie P. has got show. the the uh, the standard Jerry curls, how we call it here at PFF. That is impressive hair, but he's proud of it. Yeah, that guy will not trim to a normal haircut. He refuses. Absolutely refuses. Well, there's no I'm, normal haircut that you can you can't make that into just a true, normal. True. True. Let's get out of Steve here. We're just burying him at this uh, point. Yeah, that was Wingard's first start of the year, so I, we can't bury him too much. Exactly. On UDFA making first start. That's not bad. Sorry, man. Let's go Ryan Finley. He played so poorly, he got benched for Andy Dalton. Snip, snap, snip, snap, <laughs> snip, snap. Um, Cincinnati Bengals quarterback, NC State product, went 12 for 26, 192 yards, 26.5 PFF passing grade. I've said this. So here, you know, PFF has me doing a lot of the Cincinnati um, radio hits around here. Mm-hmm. I, I work with the Inquirer, write a piece for them every week, and they've been asking me, so what do you think of Ryan Finley? What's going on? And I always say, he looks like a quarterback that is a rookie, that it, it, the game is so fast for him. He's processing things so slow that he's struggling. And NC State, processing was his strength. Moving through progressions was yeah. his strength. And now when it is your weakness, you, you don't have a lot of things going for you. He's not a, he doesn't have a talented arm. He's struggling to get things open to bad receiving core. And I think he really has, you know, it, it just everything happens so quickly for him. And that offensive line isn't good. Mm-hmm. Billy Price, there's a rep. Go back to the Raiders-Bengals game. Maurice Hurst against Billy Price. It is incredible. Billy Price gets buried. But anyway, back to Ryan Finley not playing well bench now and I think this Ryan Finley is why a lot of I think evaluators get terrified about arm strength Mm -hmm. is because if you don't have the arm strength you have to be perfect like you have to be so good or else you look like Ryan Ryan Finley Mm -hmm. like you have to be with throwing with anticipation you have to be going through progressions very tight to win in the NFL and yes you can do it but it was soon as you're a tick slow and soon as you're that half step behind there's no margin for error with your with you know with poor arm strength and so Finley just all of a sudden it falls apart and it looks awful it looks just so bad uh and that's how Finley looks and that's what Gardner Minshew looks like in the fourth quarter of the Houston Texans game when he got benched as soon as as soon as processing became a problem Problem. As soon as he wasn't perfect in his mm-hmm. progressions, he threw three. Th- he had three turnovers in one quarter and lost that game. And yeah. now he's benched and Nick Foles is starting. I think that's what you saw with Ryan Finley every time he took the field. You know, yeah. he, he wasn't yes. perfect with his progressions, wasn't perfect with his ball placement, and with a bad offensive line, Quick bad receiving core, quickly. it was bad. Yeah. It was bad, so bad that they're putting Andy Dalton back in, scorned lover, getting back yeah. into the mix there. As a Bengals fan, you have to be like. What is going on? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You're I mean, like, AJ Green if, might if play they, now. If they end up winning two games and not getting the Redskins overall get the first now, overall pick, but here we are on imagine? this. Redskins get the first overall pick. Do you think they go Burrow? Um, 
that's a good question. No, because if they get the first two. overall pick, I could see them going Chase Young. Yeah, and, and then, then Joe the, Burrow falls to Bengals at two. Yeah, well, the Dolphins could still get the number one too. So yeah, and they could play the Dolphins. So that's why that'd be one of the teams they'd lose to. So it used to be the Tua Bowl. Now it's the Burrow Bowl. Mm-hmm. That Miami Dolphins Cincinnati Bengals right, game yeah. coming up. All right, last uh, blackout segment here. We got to bring up DK Metcalf. Did not look good in this game. Oh, struggled. I mean, and I feel like it's it's. It's tried and true at this point, but he struggled to change direction in this game. <laughs> I mean, trying to like go after the like when he tried to adjust to that pass, mm-hmm. that Russell Wilson deep ball in the end zone, that was a struggle for him. He he's not good at in cutting routes. He's very limited as a receiver, and I feel like you see that in games like this. He also had two drops in this game. Yeah, two drops. Another one that was a dive that hit his hands that you know maybe he could have hauled it in. Mm-hmm. Uh, a tough catch. But, but it was it was a nice route to like. He had good separation. Was it Wilson a good just, route or was it terrible? Okay, it was like, terrible coverage. Jalen Mills. <laughs> I mean, he just ran a straight line. That's what you worry about with the four six corner, though. It's like he can't, you just can't run with DK Metcalf. But uh, yeah, he had another one where it was, it was contested that he dropped, and he hasn't been great, you know, in those contested situations, you know, in those sort of fifty fifty balls this year, which a little concerning. I mean, it's year one, but that was kind of a criticism of him coming out was for as physically dominant as he was, was not, you know, absolutely just mossing guys, so to speak, at the catch point uh, routinely there at all miss but yeah the adjustment to the deep ball that would have been a touchdown was probably the biggest one where it's like ooh, that like that was just bad because one <laughs> yeah. you're not tracking it well uh, and two and then once you do get there you drop it so mm-hmm. like there's two you know two wrongs there it still doesn't make a right uh ugly play for dk Metcalf. <laughs> yeah absolutely i mean it's it's unfortunate for dk Metcalf because i feel like he does have still a very special talent very capable of being on our raise a glass segment and stuff like that but i mean it's it's it is a blackout for and him. we've I think we talked about it before the draft. We said, you look at him, you want to be Julio Jones. Mm -hmm. Never going to be Julio Jones. He's closer to Deshaun Jackson than he is Julio Jones. Mm -hmm. That's fine. You can win with that in the NFL, but you just have to have to set your expectations reasonably. Absolutely. Well, that's going to do it for the two for one drafts podcast. We will not be doing a Thanksgiving pod. This will be it for this week, but we'll be back on it on the saddle for the following week. Uh, Remember, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. We're also sometimes live on YouTube Tuesdays and Thursdays, but make sure you like, subscribe, PFS podcast again, two for one drafts with um, Austin and Mike. Thanks for watching the PFF YouTube channel. And if you want to subscribe, all you have to do is push the button. Don't forget everything you get. A little fantasy, push the button. A little green line for the gambling aspects of the game, push the button. College football, push the button. The YouTube channel from PFF.